It's so interesting that since official psychiatry, and I underline that word official because I hope those of you in this audience who are therapists will regard yourselves as unofficial. <laughs> Lisa, that'll give you an out. <laughs> but nevertheless, official psychiatry has curious things in common with Western religion as well as with Eastern. With Eastern, I said, only in so far as it has an interest in states of consciousness and inclines to regard other states of consciousness than the ordinary as sick. But it has one very important feature in common with Western religion. And to that, we have to go a little bit into Western religious history and ask ourselves what in Western religion, and especially in Christianity, and this goes also for Judaism and Islam, what is the great heresy? Curiously enough, the great heresy was first in the West committed by no less a person than Jesus Christ, who believed himself to be God. This, of course, will be unquestionably true if you think that the Gospel of St. John has historical value. It's a little vaguer in the Synoptic Gospels, but if you read the Gospel of St. John, there is absolutely no doubt about it, for he said, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He said all that according to this gospel. And that is something that in the Western world you are not supposed to say. And especially you are not supposed to believe it. <laughs> and naturally it was very difficult for Jesus because he was saying all this in the context of the Hebrew culture. And he tried to find language in the Hebrew scriptures with which to express his state of consciousness because he had an unusual state of consciousness. As I read it, he had cosmic consciousness, otherwise known as mystical experience, otherwise known as moksha, nirvana, bodhi, satori, fana alfana, or what you will. And that happens to people. It has happened as far back as we know. It happens all over the world and in all cultures. We don't know very much about it. We don't really know ways in which to make it happen because it seems to be of the nature of it that it is a spontaneous surprise. But it unquestionably happens. And most people keep their mouths shut about it when it does. I had a friend who in the middle of having a stroke had this illumination and he said to me I fear to speak to my friends of this but it was the most beautiful experience I shall never be afraid of death in fact I recommend everyone to have a stroke <laughs> <laughs> this was my friend Jean Varda lately deceased Greek painter but Jesus certainly had this transformation of consciousness and he was crucified for it. Why? Because he had committed an act of insubordination and treason against the cosmic government. Because if you believe that God is a monarch, an absolute omniscient and omnipotent authority, shall we say a sort of cosmic ego, then to claim to be that is to introduce democracy into the kingdom of heaven, to use up divine authority and to speak in its name without proper authorization. And they asked Jesus, by what authority do you speak, of heaven or of men? And he was tricky about answering that one. He said, by what authority did John the Baptist speak? And they were nervous about answering that one. 
he could have asked by what authority did Isaiah speak, etc. Or Moses. But Moses became official authority. And if you could wangle it that what you said was simply an extension of what Moses said because Rabbi so-and-so said it, who got it from Rabbi so-and-so, who got it from Rabbi so-and-so, who got it from Rabbi so-and-so, who got it from Moses, then it's okay. Notice this. That to be an authority today in the academic world depends on documentation. It's not enough to say, for I say unto you, you must put in your footnotes. And the more the footnotes, the more the authority, obviously. So, our dissertations tend to be books about books, about books about books. And our libraries multiply by mitosis. So, when somebody speaks as an authority that means speaks as the author that's all it means it's a statement for which you of which you are the author and therefore for which you assume responsibility that is to speak with authority and to be original is likewise not to be freaky but to speak from the origin that is what Christians mean when they say to speak in the spirit to have your mouth possessed by the Holy Spirit as they believe the mouth of Jesus was possessed by the Holy Spirit. So the gospel of Jesus, which of course was hushed up from its inception, was that wake up everybody and find out who you are. Asking that, again in the Gospel of St. John, they, pointing to his disciples, may be one, even as you, Father, and I are one. And when he was accused of blasphemy, the Jews took up stones to stone him, you know. And he said, many good works have I shown you from the Father, and from which of these do you stone me? And they said, for a good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. Now listen to the reply. He said, is it not written in your law, I have said ye are gods? And if that is what the scripture says, it can't be denied. So why do you tell me I blaspheme because I say I am a son of God? No answer. Because I said I am a son of God. It doesn't say that in your King James translation. It says I am the son of God. And you'll see the the italicized and you will think that that is for emphasis if you don't realize that passages in italics in the King James Bible are interpolations by the translators. In Greek, leaving out the definite article is equivalent of having the indefinite article. We us to you is a son of God, not o us to you. So son of, in Hebrew and in Arabic means of the nature of. When we call someone a son of a bitch, we mean bitchy. And so if you call someone a son of God, you mean divine. Of the nature of God. As the Nicene Creed subsequently defined it, he is of one substance with the Father. But what happened was that this being blasphemy for the Jews... It became blasphemy for the Christians, for anyone else than Jesus to say it. They said, okay, baby, it was so with you, but there it stops. No more of this business. <laughs> and as a result of that, Jesus was made irrelevant by pedestalization, by being kicked upstairs. <laughs> In spite of the fact that he said, greater works than these that I do shall you do. Oh no, upstairs with you, baby, because uh, we just can't have that sort of thing going on in a monarchical universe. We are not going to have democracy in the kingdom of heaven. 
So, this is why the gospel is impossible. Because we are supposed to follow the example of Christ. Where he says, for example, be not anxious for the morrow. Do not worry about what you shall eat, what you shall drink, and what you shall wear. God will take care of you. Doesn't he take care of the birds? Don't the flowers grow? And they're wonderful. They're crazy. They're great. What are you worrying about? I've never heard a sermon preached on that. <laughs> never. <laughs> because it's totally subversive. The economy would crash. <laughs> <laughs> so they say, oh, yes, that's all very well. But he was the boss's son. <laughs> <laughs> See? He had that colossal advantage. <laughs> Take up your cross and follow him. Hey, but wait a minute. I don't know I'm going to be resurrected three days later. <laughs> I can't do all those miracles. He had an unfair advantage. So how can you ask us to follow the example of Christ? But supposing he didn't have an unfair advantage... Supposing that what was true about Jesus as a son of God is true of us. Only, only a few of us know it. And we are pretty careful to be quiet about it, <laughs> lest the same thing happen to us as happened to Jesus. <laughs> and indeed it often does. And you know, you get these people from Arkansas or... Uh, Texas or uh, anywhere in the Bible Belt who never heard of the Upanishads and they have this cosmic consciousness experience and they realize that that's what happened to Jesus they say I'm Jesus come back well everybody says to them you aren't Jesus it's pretty obvious you're not Jesus you're just jo you're just Joe Dukes well they say he says that's what they said about Jesus <laughs> he has a perfect argument except they say you're not much of a Jesus <laughs> They say, uh, all right, if you're Jesus, command that these stones may be made bread. And he says, a wicked and deceitful generation seeketh for a sign, and there shall no sign be given. <laughs> now, why talk about this? Is it interesting? Is it important for the human being to realize that in some sense of the word, whatever it means, he is God or one with God? As is plainly taught by the Hindus, hinted at by the Buddhists, only they don't like to put it out as a concept in case people will use the concept as an idol to hang on to. They want you to find out for yourself and not believe in it. And certainly the Taoists understand it, the Sufis understand it, a lot of people understand it. But so what? Well, the importance of it is this, that to know that you are God is another way of saying that you feel completely with this universe. You feel profoundly rooted in it and connected with it. You feel, in other words, that the whole energy which expresses itself in the galaxies is intimate. It is not something to which you are a stranger, but it is that with which you, whatever that is, are intimately bound up. That in your seeing, your hearing, your talking, your thinking, your moving, you express that which it is which moves the sun and other stars. And if you don't know that, if you don't feel that, well, naturally, you feel alien. You feel a stranger in the world. And if you feel a stranger, you feel hostile. And therefore, you start to bulldoze things about, to beat it up, and to try and make the world submit to your will, and you become a real troublemaker. So I feel also uh, one reason why you become hostile is that feeling that you were just brought into this place that your father and mother went up to some monkey business that they probably shouldn't have done or it was bad rubber goods and as a result of this, here you are and you didn't ask to be here. Well, you always feel you can turn around and blame them. You can blame somebody. 
You can blame the government, you can blame the rascals, you can blame the, blame the cheaters. Always supposing you yourself aren't a rascal, which is a long odds. Uh, <laughs> you always can blame someone and say, I didn't ask for it, take it away. And yet, and yet, and yet, very few people are all too ready to take it away. Camus said that the only serious philosophical problem is whether or not to commit suicide. And if you don't, if you don't say take it away, what are you going to do? You've really got to assume responsibility for it. You've got to say yes to what happens. It's my karma. And that doesn't mean merely, there are many in misinterpretations of the doctrine of karma. It's usually and popularly understood is that what happens to you, either fortunate or unfortunate, is the result of good or bad deeds in a previous life. Well, that's popular superstition. The real meaning of karma, the word in Sanskrit means simply doing. And if I say of an event it is your karma, it is saying it is your doing. So the exposition, a book which would expound karma, would be not so much a who done it as a you done it. <laughs> but that seems fantastic.